everyone and welcome. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight to discuss the Ward 3 Complete Streets project. Uh, before we go any further, I want to acknowledge that even though we're meeting virtually, we are still on the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And today, the city of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we recognize that we all have a role to play in protecting the land, the air, the water, and the sacred medicines of this place. And we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land, be present to the realities and contribution of Indigenous people around us, so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbours, partners, and caretakers today. And I want to acknowledge that it's National Indigenous Peoples Month as well. So thank you for joining us. And also, I want to say thank you for your patience, uh, dear Ward 3 residents and neighbors. Uh, this has been a long and I think pretty amazing process, um, moving from resident engagement to you emailing the Ward 3 office with your concerns around safety, with your concerns about speeding on our neighborhood roadways, which led me to move a motion back in October 20 for a comprehensive Ward 3 complete streets review, which gives us an opportunity to bring together both resident concern and input, along with the technical analysis, in order for us to look at what we're going to be looking at today. So I want to acknowledge everybody who participated in the, uh, it's almost like a dot democracy, right? Putting your tabs on the map uh, using the digital platform. And for all of you who said, no, nope, not going to engage that way. I'm just going to send you my email and phone you about my concerns. I want you to know that uh, we made sure that all of that input was uh, fed into this project and this overall comprehensive review. So with no further ado, I do want to introduce uh, the consultants from WSP who have been shepherding, taking in all that input and bringing us to this stage right now. And James Justin is joining us and James Schofield. So over, the two, over to the two of you, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nan. Um, and uh, so I really appreciate uh, the introduction. and. Um, so my name is Justin Jones. I'm going to be your, uh, your facilitator for this evening. I'm one of the co-presenters. And in a moment, I will turn it over to my colleague, James Schofield. Um, I do just want to give a little bit of information about how this evening is going to run and, and how we're looking to engage with the, uh, with the questions and comments that we're receiving today. Um, so first and foremost, uh, we are using the Zoom webinar platform, which means that you are going to be kind of in, uh, in listen only mode, essentially. So you're, you have the ability to, uh, to listen to what we're saying, to watch our screen. Um, you can raise your hand uh, at, during the Q&A if you wish to ask a question verbally. Um, but for the, the ease of us recording the questions that we get and being able to post those responses on the Engage Hamilton page, we would prefer that you use the Q&A function that you'll find in your Zoom toolbar. Uh, the chat is available to hosts and panelists, so if there's anything that you would like to provide with uh, us with that you uh, would like to share um, without being in the Q&A, if there's any technical difficulties you're encountering, we do have people on the call that can assist you with that, so please let us know. We have enabled closed captioning and live transcription for this event to ensure that it is accessible for those with hearing impairments, and we hope that we are able to answer all of your questions as we move through this project and present to you uh, this incredibly comprehensive road safety review that we've undertaken for Ward 3. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name is Justin Jones. I'm the engagement lead. Uh, I would like to introduce the, uh, the project manager from the city side before turning it over to our project manager here at WSP, James Schofield. So uh, I'll introduce Brad Wiley to the group. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for all your participation in this project. And I'm very excited for where we're at today. And uh, let Justin and James roll through this and uh, do what they do best. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks so much. All right, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to James. We're going to walk you through a, a presentation about the uh, 
about the project. I was going to say a brief presentation, but we are going to present quite a bit of information here. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity to move into uh, some question and answer. And hopefully we are able to, uh, to provide you with the kinds of information that you, uh, that you are looking for out of this project. So James, take it away. Great, thanks very much, Justin. As Justin mentioned, my name is James Schofield and I'm the uh, project manager from WSP on this project. I'm very excited to be working with uh, Justin and all of the, uh, the staff at the city of Hamilton on this uh, quite exciting project to us. Um, so you see here on the screen, the, the agenda. So we've started off with some introductions and then we'll just be giving you a bit of an overview of the the status of the project, what's been accomplished so far, where we are today, and what's going to be coming in the next few months. Um, we'll be presenting some of our technical analysis that we've undertaken to um, review the concerns that have been identified in, in Ward 3. And then we'll be presenting to you some of our design alternatives, some of our ideas for addressing some of these concerns. And um, I will caution you, there are quite a few of them. So we will do our best to, uh, to to present them to you and there will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. So if you have questions about what's happening on your specific street or in your specific part of the ward, we're more than happy to drill into those details and, um, and tackle those at that point. Um, so Justin, let's advance to the next slide there. All right, so the project overview. So. This project is all about creating a plan to improve safety on the neighborhood streets in Ward 3. Um, in doing so, we're applying um, Vision Zero and complete streets principles. So really focused on safety of our most vulnerable road users um, on these streets. And the scope of our project really encompasses the local and collector streets in all of the Ward 3 neighborhoods. So you can see the map on the screen there, just illustrating all of the different neighborhoods within Ward 3 that we've been looking at as part of our study. Um, I would like to note that the scope of our project does not include the arterial street network in Ward 3. So we certainly understand that there are many concerns on the big arterial roads, such as Main and King and Barton. Um, those streets are not within our project scope. We're really focused on the local and collector streets in the ward. Um, and we're also not looking at the intersections of the arterial and arterial roads, but we are looking at the intersections of the more minor streets. Um, so that's the project overview. And then where we are in terms of the overall project. So we've been been working for quite a while now. We started off with an information gathering phase, which was really about reviewing all of the, uh, the background information available to us, um, doing some engagement, the, the exercise that many of you participated in of dropping some pins on the map, illustrating where your concerns are. Um, so we, we've reviewed all of that information. We've also done quite a bit of data collection. So um, going out into the onto the streets, installing traffic counting devices, measuring speeds and volumes, um, getting a really robust data set to understand the conditions as they are today. And we've also been reviewing um, quite a bit of the collision data within Ward 3 to understand where the problems are from a collision perspective. Um, then we moved on to developing design alternatives. So looking at different techniques for both calming and also diverting traffic. So diverting being more about um, trying to address cut through traffic within the local streets. Um, we've been looking at safety countermeasures or safety improvements that could be targeted at certain locations. Um, we've also been looking on some of the collector streets at ways that we might um, carve up the space um, in the street differently. So looking at different cross sections for how we might configure some streets. And then with all that done, um, we've presented this to an internal working group within the city, a technical advisory committee. Um, we've had a presentation with your, with your counselor, and we're here tonight with the Public Information Center to present this to all of you. Um, and following this presentation, we will be going and refining the alternatives that are being presented tonight. We'll be producing a draft report and then a final report and aiming to, to wrap the project up in August. Um, 
A couple of things I'd like to mention just from the outset. So first of all, the design alternatives that we're going to be presenting tonight are preliminary. So nothing that you see today is final. We are, are here showing you our ideas. We're looking for your feedback. Um, we'd like to understand um, maybe we missed something. Maybe we, we went too far um, in some areas. Maybe, maybe there's something that you'd like to suggest that we do differently. Um, we're open to all of that feedback and we will consider that feedback before finalizing our recommendations in our report. Um, I'd also like to note that some design treatments that you see here today, some of them we're fairly confident that you could go and implement them very quickly. Things like speed cushions, um, we, we generally expect that um, without much further study, you could go and implement a speed cushion. But there are other types of treatments um, that may require further study before we can uh, confirm the, the suitability of those techniques. So things like um, raised intersections, for example. And so we'll, we'll talk about that more in this presentation, what a raised intersection is. But certain types of measures may require um, some, some drainage analysis to make sure that it's, it's constructible, um, that water will still flow in a, in a way that's desirable. Um, may require some traffic analysis, or it may require some coordination with other projects. And as you know, there's a lot going on in Ward 3. You have the LRT coming in, um, you have the, uh, the two-way conversion of Main Street that was recently approved by council. And you have a number of other projects uh, such as uh, cycle tracks being implemented on Victoria Avenue. Um, in short, there's a lot of things going on in Ward 3 and we have to make sure that all the pieces come together. Um, and finally, the the implementation timelines and the funding sources have not yet been determined for all of these measures. So some of them could be implemented in the short term, some in the medium term, some in the long term. We haven't done the work yet of prioritizing um, to figure out the exact sequence that would be followed. So um, we just want to walk you through Sorry, I skipped a the slide there, James. That's OK. Are you trying to speed me up? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we're OK so far. <laughs> um, do you mind going back, Justin? Thanks. So we, we do want to just walk you through the process that we went through um, to, to understand the concerns in Ward 3. So quite a bit of input data was reviewed. We have um, all of the concerns, both from the pins that you've dropped on the map as part of our engagement, also, um, the concerns that you've emailed to your counselor or to city staff. So we've, we've got a long list of concerns there. Um, we've been looking at the traffic data. So looking at the, the traffic counts and going out and doing additional counts in some, some cases. And we've also been looking at the collision history. So looking at five years of collisions in Ward 3 and looking at a tool that the city has developed, a network screening tool that allows us to identify some of the hotspots in the ward where um, there are um, higher than expected number of collisions. And finally, we've also been looking at um, some other um, ongoing studies and trying to coordinate our work with things such as the cycling master plan, um, there's a draft bicycle boulevard feasibility study underway. There's a complete streets design manual that's underway. We're also looking at the HSR service and their detour routes and trying to align our work with all of these other things. Go to the next slide now, Justin. Yeah, it was lagging. See, it, I don't know. It's not agreeing with me tonight. All right. There we go. Um, so. A couple of maps here just to, to illustrate some things at a very, very high level. Um, we've, we've mapped here the existing traffic calming measures in Ward 3. And all of the little triangles that you see on this map represent a speed cushion. Um, the little uh, purple axis represent pedestrian crossovers. Um, so those are the crossings where you push a button and often there's a, a rapid flashing light that comes on to cross the street. Um, and when we look at what's been implemented to date in Ward 3, th these, these are the measures that you see most commonly throughout the ward. Um, so part of what we're going to be doing tonight is presenting some new measures that you may not be familiar with, um, some other ways of addressing some concerns, different techniques for traffic calming and traffic diversion. Um, so we'll be getting into that in a, in a little bit here. And then the, the uh, results of that online engagement exercise, we received 764 comments, which to us is really phenomenal. So we really do appreciate all of the, 
pins that were dropped on the map, everything that you wrote in the comments. Um, our project team has uh, read and reviewed every single one of these comments. And we've just put um, a little pie chart on the screen there to, to kind of show how they, they break down the speeding and aggressive driving being the most common concern that was raised throughout this exercise. Um, certainly a lot of concerns noted about the safety of crossing streets, about uh, conditions near schools, um, about cut through traffic, in some cases about um, trucks cutting through. Um, so quite, quite a good amount of um, information was gathered through, through all of these um, concerns that, that you, the residents, have identified. You know, so almost 800 comments received. So how do we, how do we deal with those? And um, the city's traffic calming guidelines has what they call a pre-screening process, which is a bit of a filter that we apply to identify the areas that um, should be prioritized. So what we, we did is we filtered all of those comments that were received through this pre-screening process to help us identify the locations where there was the greatest need for traffic calming interventions. And you can see these criteria are looking at things like traffic volumes. So whether there's more than 500 vehicles a day on the street being one of the criteria. Um, most of the other criteria kind of apply across the board to most of the local street network. So um, being a local street, less than 50 kilometers an hour residential land uses. Um, they, most of those are passed within the local street network. So it was that volume criteria that that was often the, the factor that kind of uh, determined whether, whether a street would be prioritized. And we'll, um, we'll show you when we get into our design alternatives and some of the maps that we've put together, um, how this plays out. Apart from the um, public engagement we were also looking at the collision data, as I mentioned. So we looked at five years of collision records in Ward 3. Um, and we, we took a bit of a multi-pronged approach here. So on the left side, we have a collision-based approach, which was about looking at the sites that have had the most collisions or the most potential for improvement in their collision rates over the past five years. Going and looking at those sites trying to diagnose them and trying to come up with specific improvements that could be tailored to those hotspots. Then on the right side, we also took more of a systemic approach, which rather than looking at specific locations, what we were doing is looking at risk factors. And this is kind of recognizing that just because you have a collision at one, uh, one intersection last year, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a collision at that same intersection next year, but there might be risk factors in common that we can look at and try to address. Um, so we, we use the systemic approach to try and identify um, risk factors and identify some things that we could do on a fairly widespread basis throughout the ward um, to try and improve safety at some locations. Um, in the next few slides here, we'll just show you some of the outcomes of these two types of analysis. So the crash-based review, we were looking at the top five intersections, excuse me, and the top five mid-block segments within the ward. And we've got them listed here on the screen. Um, just a reminder that the scope of our project doesn't include the arterial arterial intersections or the, the arterial mid-block segments. Um, so certainly there are some issues on some of those arterials, but really we were focused on more of the collector and local roads as part of the study. And then if we look at the next screen here, Justin. Mm -hmm. um, so as part of that systemic review, we really started to drill into the signalized intersections within the ward. And in particular, at the pedestrian collisions at those signalized intersections. And a couple things um, really jumped out at us when we did this analysis. Um, first of all, pedestrians are involved in about almost a quarter of the serious collisions at those signalized intersections that we reviewed. Um, in 77% of the time, the pedestrian was crossing with the right of way. And what we found is that the left turning movement was the dominant pedestrian collision type. So the left turn at 62% 
It's the most common type of movement that a vehicle was making when it collided with a pedestrian. And so that really focused our attention on those left turn conflicts. And um, we tried to put together some, some things that could be done to address some of those collisions. And some of those things that we came up with are shown here on this slide. So these are things that we could implement on a fairly widespread basis throughout Ward 3 at, at the signalized intersections to try and address some of these pedestrian collisions. So um, painting a better crosswalk marking, so using a zebra crosswalk marking is something that just really makes the crosswalk pop a little better to drivers. Um, implementing a leading pedestrian interval. So that's where the walk signal comes on a few seconds before the green light for the driver that gives the pedestrian a few seconds of a head start um, before the cars get a green light. Um, we can also review the sight lines and the illumination and make sure that there's, there's no issues from that perspective. Um, and then in terms of reducing the speed of vehicles and reducing the severity of the conflicts, um, we can do something called center line hardening that we'll show on the next slide. We can also do things like reducing the radius of the corner or reducing the crossing width. And the intent of, of these measures is to really slow down cars as they're making these turns um, and give drivers more reaction time um, and, and reduce the severity of those conflicts with pedestrians. Um, Center line hardening is a bit of um, a novel treatment that hasn't been used much in Hamilton to date. So we wanted to explain what that's all about. And you kind of see the concept here on the screen. Um, so the idea is to put um, a physical device on the roadway um, right on the center yellow line and ideally extending beyond the crosswalk there as you see in the figure. And this is a little bit of a, a raised curb. So um, a truck or a larger vehicle would be able to drive over it. But if you're, if you're driving over it with a passenger vehicle, you'd certainly feel a bump. Um, and the intent is to really encourage drivers to make um, a sharper turn and a slower speed turn as they come around the corner. So rather than making like a wide sweeping movement, as you see on the left, um, you make a much sharper um, acute angle turn. Um, as you see on the right. Um, an example here of some of the other measures that we're talking about, so reducing the turning radius, decreasing the crossing width. Um, this is an example that was um, applied at Barton and Lotridge not too long ago. Um, so you can see in the top right how the the curb has been bulbed out into the intersection to sharpen that corner and to reduce the crossing width for the pedestrian. So this is something that we would you know, recommend um, at these signalized intersections to, to slow down drivers and to reduce that the crossing width and the exposure to traffic. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh... I just want to walk through some of the design alternatives and some of the options that we were investigating as we went through this assignment and uh, and just some of the things that you're going to see when we move into uh, into talking about neighborhood by neighborhood and street by street uh, interventions that we're proposing for Ward 3. So some of the traffic calming interventions uh, that you may have already seen in Ward 3 would include things like speed cushions. Uh, so, you know, these are kind of your traditional like speed bumps, um, but they will typically have uh, a, a middle section there that will allow uh, heavy vehicles to travel through. Um, so buses, fire trucks, um, without necessarily hitting those speed cushions. So it allows transit vehicles to move through uh, at a little bit more speed without uh, causing discomfort to passengers. The other ones that you might see are uh, curb extensions with parking bays. Uh, these are some something that we recommended in a couple of places in Ward 3. Um, you see them here on Sherman, uh, although it with the one-way configuration, obviously we just don't have necessarily as much of the traffic calming impact as we would hope that they have in some of the places that we are recommending them. Some of the ones that you may not have seen 
uh, that we are going to be recommending and that are going to be uh, included in our assignment here are things like neighborhood traffic circles, uh, which provide some visual friction within a four way intersection to uh, to reduce the ability for people to just kind of go right through the intersection. So they cause a little bit of, uh, you know, they have to, people kind of have to turn around them. Uh, raised crosswalks or intersections, there are some of these around the city of Hamilton, but um, looking at uh, at where the crosswalk essentially kind of functions almost like a speed bump or a speed cushion itself. Um, and there is a, a larger version of that where it's a raised intersection where the entire intersection comes up to, uh, to meet the level of the sidewalk um, to provide that pedestrian priority. Uh, floating bus stops. So these can be integrated with uh, with cycling facilities like we show here um, from the city of London, or they can be uh, implemented without the cycling facility to provide a wider platform and a more accessible uh, embarking and disembarking option for people who use mobility devices. Uh, and then curb extension. So, uh, you know, kind of similar to what James was talking about there at Lotridge. So those are the types of, uh, those are some of the types of traffic calming interventions that are going to be recommended. And then there's some uh, some other ones that we're looking at. So these are things like uh, like diagonal diverters, um, which would uh, which would essentially kind of force folks to uh, to turn uh, when they arrive at an intersection. So it prevents through movement, uh, but it still prevent uh, still provides space for emergency services vehicles to travel through. Um, there's directional closures, uh, and those would be places where, uh, you know, at an intersection, there would just be, uh, whether it's a bulb out like this, um, that provides the closure for, uh, for allowing vehicles to go through that specific uh, route. Um, those are something that we're recommending a fair bit in Ward 3. Uh, right in, right out are an option to uh, kind of reduce people turning left into a, uh, into a, a, um, a street and also pre preventing through movement uh, when there is a continuous corridor that's, uh, that's moving through. And then, uh, and then we're recommending some of these little planters just in conjunction with, uh, with one-way conversion. And we'll talk a little bit more about the one-way conversion because we all know that in Hamilton, uh, talking about one-way is, is, um, is, you know, we, we don't wanna, we're talking about converting streets from one-way to two-way right now. Um, and so when we say that we want to look at some one-way conversions, um, we want to be specific about the fact that we are talking about alternating one ways. Um, so we are looking at providing uh, essentially a street would change directions in terms of what one way it is at, uh, at an intersection. And so that would prevent it from being used as a through route. Um, and we'll show what that means on the map. It's, it's hard to describe without a map in front of us. So I'll get there in a minute. So in terms of what we're recommending, uh, we have taken a ward wide approach. We have evaluated uh, essentially every street in the ward that is not a uh, that is not an arterial road, and we have run it through that pre-screen criteria. Uh, we have taken a systemic approach, and we have made a recommendations for 180 physical measures uh, to reduce vehicle speeds, uh, to reduce cut through volumes, and to enhance space for people walking, cycling, using transit, and using mobility devices. Um, we have uh, applied some of the best practices when, with regards to, to traffic calming and traffic diversion, um, and we are really excited about the scale of change that we are recommending for Ward 3. Uh, we are proposing 21 new high visibility crossings, as well as a widespread uh, overhaul of the pavement marking and signage throughout the ward. Um, to make sure that everything is uh, is kind of up to up to current standard. So I just want to give you a quick sense of what we're looking at here before I walk through some of the different uh, some of the different recommendations that we're making. And so after this session, we are going to make the link available to a tool called Miro. Um, Miro is an online whiteboard, and what it essentially allows you to do is it will allow you to see uh, the entire ward, uh, and you can zoom in on it as you would like to. So I'm going to show you my Miro tool right here. So this is what the Miro board will look like. You'll be able to see uh, the entire ward, and you'll be able to zoom in and see individual streets, individual measures that we are proposing. So we do have a legend over on the right hand side here. And you can see the types of measures that we are recommending. You can see 
visual examples of those types of measures. Um, and then on the Miro board here, you can see where those measures are recommended. So you can see within each different neighborhood, what types of measures are being recommended at this stage of the project. So the Miro tool is available for you. And on the, uh, on, the board, on the side here, you'll see that there's a little comment function. You can actually use that comment function uh, to let us know if there's anything that you think should be changed, should be modified, should be updated. Um, and so we would, uh, we will set, like I say, we will share this link um, and we will let folks have, uh, have their opportunity to, uh, to provide those comments. We'll also use this after the, uh, during the Q&A, just so that if you have specific questions about specific neighborhoods, we can get into it. Um, but this is a good opportunity for you to, to take a look at kind of the nuts and bolts of what we're recommending within Ward 3. Um, and uh, and to you know ask your questions about what types of measures we're recommending. So I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint and I'm going to walk through a few of the uh, the really specific measures that we are uh, that we are recommending that you may not have seen uh, in uh, in the city of Hamilton just yet. So some of the examples of the interventions that we're recommending would be things like a write in write out channel. And so what this does is it, uh, it means that for, you know, a, a good example here would be at, uh, at Burge Street and Emerald Street North. Um, so here, one of the main concerns that we heard was cut through traffic. We saw high volumes and high speeds of cut through traffic, people coming from Victoria, driving all the way over to Wentworth using Burge as a cut through. So by introducing a right in right out island at Bird Street, it means that there is no left turns allowed. So it means that if people are coming on birds, they're not able to use Bird Street as a continuous cut through anymore. So uh, we suspect that that will uh, that that will reduce the number of cut through vehicles using Burge and uh, and reduce the number of, uh, of vehicles using that corridor. So just to note, these are for uh, illustration only. Obviously, these are not like engineering drawings. They're just kind of for us to, to show you a little bit about what these types of interventions would do from a functional standpoint, if not from uh, a full detailed design standpoint. So some of the other interventions that we have recommended would be directional closures. So these are something that you'll see a fair number of throughout the ward. Uh, and the directional closures would essentially be a, you know, a, a physical device at the intersection that prevents people from moving in a specific direction through that, uh, through that intersection. So in this case, at, uh, at Gertrude, we would be introducing a, uh, you know, a no entry um, at Gertrude and Gage. Uh, so that would be kind of a directional closure there that would prevent people from being able to use Gertrude as a cut through um, you know, especially given that uh, that beach road uh, is on the city's newly approved truck routes. Um, I will note that when I'm going through these, I, I do want to highlight we're not showing all of the different interventions around these. We do have interventions proposed for beach road. That's one of those places where we're proposing those curb extensions and having parking on both sides to narrow the effective right of way of that corridor. Um, but we do want to just highlight that, you know, when we're showing these, we're just we're trying to show them in a nice, specific, easy to understand way so that you have a clear understanding of the specific types of measures that we're showing. Diagonal diverters, we only propose two of these through the ward uh, and we propose them at places where there's kind of a, a bit of a strange offset intersection. So there's two of them that we propose. There's King William and Stephen. And, uh, and there's Dunsmuir and, hang on, I'm just using my proctor, that's the one. Um, so those are a couple of kind of strange offset intersections where there's some challenging movements just based on the fact that they are not like kind of a through route. And so using a diagonal diverter serves a couple of different purposes there. It simplifies the movements of those intersections. Um, and it also produces, uh, you know, a, a condition where there's fewer cut through vehicles going through. So it reduces the number of cut through traffic that would be using King William to get from Victoria over to Wentworth. Um, and at, in those instances on those diagonal diverters, typically what you see is you would see that those would be kind of like a green space or, or you know, oftentimes incorporating vegetation. 
um, and they would still have space for people walking and cycling to pass through. Um, and they would also have accommodations for emergency services vehicles so that uh, so that if people need to get through their ambulances, fire trucks, et cetera, uh, that they can still get through those intersections. So another one is curb extensions. This one will be a little bit more familiar because again, James showed that example from Lottridge and Barton. So they are definitely things that you can see um, throughout Ward 3 and throughout the city of Hamilton. Um, an example here would be at Princess and Sherman. Um, and this would also be recommended at the other end at Birch and Princess as well, following a similar approach. Um, this would be done in, in concert with a, uh, with a no trucks, um, sign identification, especially reflecting the, the fact that Princess is not on the city's truck routes um, in the newly approved trucking uh, truck route plan. So we wanted to discourage the use of heavy vehicles along this corridor. Um, and so that's why we're looking at installing those kinds of curb extensions uh, to reduce the, uh, the number and speed of heavy vehicles traveling through there and the number and speed of, uh, of normal vehicles as well. And then uh, another one that you haven't seen really in uh, in Ward Three, but you are seeing a few of these in some of the uh, in some of the other wards within the city. We've seen a couple in Ward Ten, uh, <clears throat> for example, would be the uh, neighborhood traffic circle. And so these are kind of uh, a small, uh, usually with vegetation, um, little circle in the middle of the intersection that again just provides some of that visual narrowing and reduces vehicle speeds traveling through that intersection. Um, and this would also potentially be done with uh, with enhanced crosswalk mark crosswalk markings to uh, to improve safety and visibility through that intersection at West and King William. And then uh, the other one, the last one that I'll talk about here is the raised intersection. You'll see a fair number of raised intersections proposed through the board. Uh, the one here is at Belmont and Campbell. The key problems that we identified there are really that. And we saw relatively high uh, rates of, uh, of you know, people rolling through stops reported. Um, but there's also a lot of pedestrian demand, obviously, with a park and, uh, and the holy name of Jesus Catholic Elementary School right there. Uh, we do know that there's a lot of people that are using this on foot and by bike. And so to, uh, to reinforce the pedestrian priority and address those, uh, those concerns, introducing a raised crosswalk can uh, can illustrate that pedestrian priority and provide uh, those reduced vehicle speeds. And so this is what the intersection looks like now. And then this is just kind of a, a rendering of, of what it could look like. So you'll see it kind of ramps up to that raised platform, which is at the same level as the sidewalk. Uh, and it provides people with that safe, accessible path on through while, uh, while kind of reducing the, uh, the speeds of vehicles that are traveling through there. So those are, those are really just kind of some of the examples of some of the treatments that we're recommending. Um, and I'm gonna turn it back over to James and he's gonna walk you through a few of the uh, multi-neighborhood corridors that we looked at. And these are corridors that we, that we looked at because they crossed neighborhoods and we felt that they are a great way for us to really illustrate uh, the overall approach that we are taking in Ward 3 to try and uh, improve road safety. So James, why don't you take it away? Great, thanks, Justin. So yeah, what we're trying to do here is, is obviously a lot of measures being proposed all across the board and we can't speak to every single one of them um, in the time we have tonight. So we're trying to give you um, a selection of, of different things that have been proposed. So Justin has just gone through um, some examples of different types of traffic calming. What I'm going to do in this next section is just walk you through a few corridors where um, there's there's a bit more of an intensity of um, measures being proposed and where we really want to look at the corridor holistically um, to, to make sure that it makes sense from end to end. So the first one that we're going to start with here is Dunsmuir and Holton, number one on the map. And um, so the, this is Dunsmuir and Holton. We just, just start off with a map illustrating the existing conditions. So the, uh, the dark, darker orange lines on the map represent the arterial streets 
And the lines that are shaded in yellow represent the streets where that traffic calming pre-screening test was met, where all of the criteria were met for, uh, for pre-screening. Um, so where the volume was more than 500 vehicles per day and where all those other criteria were met. Um, and you know, we, we went through and read all of the comments and this is our, our synthesis of, of what we heard. Um, we, we heard a lot of concerns about cut through traffic being funneled at the west end out towards Holton, um, and also a lot of cut through traffic just on Holton itself for people um, uh, perhaps trying to change direction from going west on King to, to going east on Main. Um, there were concerns about the offset intersection at Proctor where the, the north and the south portion of the intersection don't line up. And so a um, number of, of residents reporting some, some strange behavior going on at that location. Um, throughout the whole Stipley portion here, a lot of concerns of cut through traffic on the north south streets and along Dunsmere. Um, in particular, there were some concerns about cut through traffic, trying to, to weave through those interior streets to get around the intersection of Main and Gage. Um, there were requests for approved crossings at the two arterial crossings at Dunsmere and Sherman and Dunsmere and Gage. Um, and there were some requests for always stops over in the Eastern part there at Belmont and Kensington. So what we've done is we've taken a fairly, um, holistic approach to this corridor, um, trying to address these cut through traffic concerns. Also um, trying to support the, uh, the city's um, sustainable, sustainable mobility group, which is seeking to establish um, kind of a bicycle priority condition along Dunsmere Road. Um, and so what we've come up with is something that we think um, meets the objectives of um, addressing the cut through traffic concerns and also creating a condition where we can really prioritize Dunsmere as a street for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, there's quite a bit going on here, so um, I will walk you through it. Um, the main thing to note along Dunsmere is that we're proposing a few locations where there will be directional closures. So whereas you're coming along the street, you'll come up to an intersection and there will be a do not enter sign um, forcing you to turn left or right to get off of Dunsmere. And what this is going to do is it's going to break the street up and prevent Dunsmere from being used as a continuous east-west route to get through this part of the ward. And it's really going to try and push the traffic back to the arterials, back to King and Main Street. Um, so as you work your way west to east along here, you'll see a few um, of those arrows and green boxes, those represent those directional closures. So at that location, um, traffic would only be able to flow in the direction of the arrow. And um, if you're coming the other direction, you would be forced to turn onto the intersecting street. Um, and then throughout the, um, the stiply part of, of this diagram in the center, you'll see a number of streets where we're proposing um, conversion to one-way streets. And in general, the approach that we've taken is that it goes one direction north of Dunsmere and it goes the other direction south of Dunsmere. And so the idea here is to prevent these streets from being used as a, a north-south cut-through route, um, but to still allow them to be used to, you know, to get access to your home um, or, or business or, or place that you're trying to go. Um, and the reason why we've proposed so many of these in the central part of the ward is that First of all, the three streets in the center there um, are the ones with the highest traffic volumes in this part of the ward. Um, and we, we wanted to treat them all fairly um, consistently because the fear is that if we only do one of them, then the traffic will just shift to the other one next to it. So um, we, we proposed to do it on, um, you see five streets there um, to, to apply that consistent treatment across all five of those streets where there seems to be the greater concentration of problems. Um, and then if we flip over to the, the far west side at Holton Avenue, a similar treatment being proposed there to make Holton go um, southbound, south of Dunsmere and northbound, north of Dunsmere, again, to, to break up that street so that it can't be used as a north-south cut-through route. Um, 
There is a second diagonal diverter here proposed at Dunsmuir and Proctor. So it's very similar to the other diagonal diverter that Justin was just showing you on King William. Um, again, this is one of those offset intersections where the, the legs of the intersection don't line up. And there's an opportunity here to, um, to simplify it, to reduce some of the complexity of, of people making kind of meandering movements to, to get from north to south through that area. Um, so the diagonal diverter proposed there. Um, two locations at Gage and Sherman where we're proposing um, signalization. Um, the one at Sherman is actually already being programmed by the city to, uh, to occur sometime in the near future. The one at Gage would be um, a new recommendation that we, we suggest be considered. Um, and then over in the east part of the corridor, um, kind of east of King Street, um, proposing a couple targeted locations for some intersection traffic calming with a raised intersection at those locations. Um, and then on Balmoral Avenue, there would be some speed cushions um, to address um, some issues on that street. So quite a bit to take in there. Um, we will certainly be happy to, to come back to any of these slides to, uh, to take up your questions. Um, I think we'd like to just continue through and, and present all of these corridors. And so, yeah, Justin, why don't we move on here? Um, this slide here, just showing a few examples of that directional closure that we're proposing on Dunsmuir. So I think the one on the left best illustrates the concept that we have in mind. So this would be um, you know, a, a location where we, we put up a do not enter sign except for bicycles. So allow bicycles to get through these locations so that they can travel continuously east-west along the street but as a motor vehicle, you would be forced to turn off at these locations. Um, and then there's a few other examples um, from Toronto there. Um, there's a few different ways this can be done. You could implement these as you see in the top right, just by installing um, like a, a planter box um, within the intersection to, to um, deter traffic from coming through in that direction. Um, it can also be done with more permanent infrastructure like the curb that you see in the bottom right. There's certainly an opportunity to introduce some additional plantings or greenery as part of these interventions as well. And I'll just note, you know, one thing that we, we did consider, especially on this corridor, um, is given the number of driveways and, and other uh, kind of facilities, we wanted to make sure that that we didn't, um, we, were, we were originally considering kind of some directional uh, one ways on this. And what we wanted to do here instead was was introduce these do not enter so that if you're coming out, like let's say you live on this street here and you live in this apartment complex and you wanna come out, you're not forced to actually go this way. You can continue on um, the other direction, just the same as, uh, as you would before this was here. It just means that for those folks traveling at the intersection here, they're not able to go through. So it's kind of, uh, it provides a little bit of flexibility to those, uh, to those residents. Uh, All right, thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, so this, the second corridor that we're going to present here is um, Stinson, Delaware, Maplewood. Um, this was another area where there were a number of concerns identified um, and where we wanted to look at the corridor you know, holistically. Um, so some of those concerns that we heard, um, quite a bit of um, pedestrian safety concerns raised at the intersection of Stinson and Victoria with the cars coming down the escarpment um, along Victoria, um, traveling at relatively high speeds um, and poor stop compliance being reported there. Um, on Erie Avenue, there were some concerns about cars mounting up onto the sidewalk to pass each other um, because Erie being a, a fairly narrow street with parking on one side, um, cars were sneaking up onto the sidewalk to get around each other. Uh, there were crossing safety concerns at um, Delaware and Wentworth. And a few things that kind of apply to the whole corridor are listed in the top right. Um, so fairly narrow bike lanes along the corridor. Um, some concerns relating to um, drivers making unsafe passing maneuvers of stopped buses. So a bus would be stopped in the bike lane. 
serving a bus stop and vehicles would be passing around coming into oncoming traffic, um, concerns of cut through traffic concerns. And the, the last one there, frequent transit service, not a concern, but something that we just need to keep in mind on this corridor is that it is a very frequent transit corridor, um, I believe service running as often as every seven and a half minutes along here. So maintaining that, um, that HSR service and, and not impeding it or slowing it down is certainly something that was really important to us um, along this corridor. And Justin, if you flip the slide here. So you can see the things that we're, we're proposing here. Um, the main one along Stinson, Delaware, Maplewood itself is we're proposing to have some raised transit stops along the corridor. And what this would mean is that instead of the bus pulling into the bike lane as it does today to serve the stop, um, the bus stop would actually extend out into the roadway into where the bike lane is. And cyclists would ride up and over the top of the stop as they're passing through. And what this would do is it would allow the bus to serve that stop while it's still in the lane of traffic. And this is, the intention here is that this will deter people from trying to pass a bus that stopped serving a stop. Um, and that will have a bit of a traffic calming benefit. Um, and it's also going to make it easier for buses to, to carry on along this corridor without um, having to worry about merging back into traffic after every stop that they serve. Um, Justin, if you just flip the next slide, why don't we show the, the figure of that and then we'll, oh, we don't have it. Uh, we do um, have, yeah, this is the... Yeah, so, so this is the intent here. The, the, the one on the left um, recently installed in the city of London, um, it would look something like this. So you can see um, what you have here is a bike lane that comes up and ramps up and over the top of this transit stop. And the bus would stop in that vehicle lane and people would walk across that short raised um, cycling facility to get on and off the bus. Um, another benefit of this is that it provides a bit more space for the bus to deploy its, its uh, wheelchair ramp. So from an accessibility perspective, it gives a lot more maneuvering room for um, people using mobility devices to get on and off the bus using the ramp. Um, especially along the Stinson Delaware Maplewood corridor, there's a lot of locations where we have narrow sidewalks and it can be quite challenging for a bus operator to, to safely deploy that ramp and uh, serve users who, uh, who need that ramp. So um, we think that there's um, a number of benefits to, uh, to this type of treatment um, that will help to address some of the concerns along the corridor. And why don't you flip back to the map, Justin, and we'll talk through the other measures here. So um, a few other things going on on some of the intersecting streets. Um, on Erie Street, we've proposed, again, an alternating one-way condition where it goes northbound on one part and then it goes southbound on the other. So breaking Erie up so that it's no longer um, uh, possible to use it for a cut-through movement. Um, some speed cushions proposed those, those dark blue or purple lines that you see represent speed cushions. Um, looking at some intersection improvements at the intersection of Stinson and Victoria. Um, there were some um, issues noted relating to cut through traffic on uh, Weber Street here. So what we're proposing is a no right turn restriction at Weber. So as you're coming down the escarpment, you wouldn't be able to make this turn and um, cut through those streets to avoid the stop sign at Stinson. Um, we're looking at converting the school crossing at, um, at Wentworth to a pedestrian crossover. So this would be with the, uh, the rapid flashing lights that come on when you push the button um, to, to enhance that crossing. Um, and at Delaware and Wentworth, we're actually looking at a full closure of that little portion of Delaware, just west of Wentworth. The intent there being to prevent people from cutting through along um, Grant and Delaware to bypass the traffic light at Stinson and Wentworth um, and to, to keep that traffic on Stinson. 
Um, and we, we believe that that could be done without impacting any of the driveways along Delaware in that location. Um, moving along the Delaware corridor, there's a few locations where you see those purple triangles that represent um, right in, right out. So these would be locations where if you're coming up the street, you're forced to turn right when you get to Delaware, you wouldn't be able to go through straight or make a left turn. So again, all about breaking up some of these north-south streets and trying to address um, some of the cut through traffic and also another interesting offset intersection there. Um, the dark, um, dark blue lines representing the speed cushions again. And I think the final one I haven't mentioned is the partial closure. And Justin, you'll have to remind me of that street name. Um, it's opposite uh, of school. Springer. Springer. Um, so that, that closure being intended to mitigate some of the cut through traffic that's occurring on Springer due to um, the school drop off and pickup activity. Um, Again, I, I appreciate that's a lot to take in. <laughs> I think we'll, uh, we'll keep on going though. Um, I do wanna get, get through this and get to questions. So uh, here at Stinson and Victoria, this intersection. So what we're thinking of here is that it's quite a wide intersection as you're coming down the escarpment and you come up to this always stop. Um, it's, it's wide enough for three lanes of traffic. Um, so we're thinking that the, uh, the curb could be extended out to reduce the width of the roadway, reduce the crossing distance. Um, you can see an example of, of what we're considering here um, on the right. And um, we believe that this would integrate well with um, some of the plans that are underway to add a, a cycle track on Victoria Avenue. Um, we would note that there would be a loss of one parking spot with this change. There's currently parking permitted in off-peak hours um, along the uh, east side of Victoria Avenue here, so a loss of one spot. Um, but we think that this would really help to, um, to address some of the safety concerns at this location. I, I, I just want to address a, a comment that came in in the Q&A, James, and, and I'll just kind of speak to it really quickly. Um, you know, one of the things that, that came in was that these can sometimes be, be difficult to navigate when you're riding a bike because uh, people waiting for transit sometimes are not quite aware that these are for, for cycling facilities. Um, this one here that you see from London, this would be an unfinished example. Obviously, it's still kind of looking a little, a little raggy there. Um, and the recommendation would be that you have more kind of the high visibility, high contrast markings on those um, so that there is a little bit more of a, um, a delineation between the cycling space and the, uh, the, the space for um, embarking and disembarking. But then it's also important to make sure that there are clear uh, delineations for people cycling uh, that they know that they are expected to yield um, from the uh, that they are expected to yield to uh, people embarking and disembarking off those transit vehicles as well. Um, so. I can take it away here, James, for Cumberland. All right, so the Cumberland corridor um, here, um, this is another um, part of the ward that generated a number of comments um, and so, some of the issues are the, the irregular intersection at Sanford, um, the concerns about heavy cut through traffic volumes along the corridor, um, lack of a sidewalk on the north side of Cumberland, and generally being difficult for pedestrians to, to cross the street at, at several locations along here, it was noted. So um, the the intent of this corridor is really to try and address the cut through traffic and try and get the cut through traffic off of Cumberland and back onto the arterial street network. And to, you know, similar to, Del to Delaware, um, sorry, to Dunsmere, <laughs> to make this more of a bicycle and pedestrian priority corridor, you know, representing that it provides a pretty good connection throughout this part of the city over to Gage Park. Um, 
we want to try and really um, reduce the traffic volumes and make it more of an appealing corridor for pedestrians and cyclists. And you can flip the slide, Justin. So th the things that we're considering here on Cumberland, um, we're looking at um, a number of measures, again, to try and address that cut through traffic. So some directional closures at some locations where you would um, be forced to turn off the corridor where you wouldn't be able to continue straight through. Um, and similar to Dunsmuir, these kind of alternate directions. So you be able to travel for a distance um, one way in one direction, and then um, it would switch. Um, there's a few neighborhood traffic circles proposed along the corridor, um, the four of them, the red circles that you see. And uh, we'd be looking at um, doing some, some traffic calming measures on Cumberland and Rutherford as well to, uh, to try and, and slow down those streets. Um, including some curb radius reductions on Rutherford there. Um, and over at Gage at the other end, we'd be looking at curb extensions again with, with some center line hardening to try and reduce the speeds of turning vehicles at that location. Um, we do have a right in, right out island um, over at Balsam in Cumberland. So, um, you know, as I said, similar to Dunsmuir, what we're trying to do here is get the cut through traffic off of the street um, and, and back up to the arterials um, and make it more of a cycling and pedestrian priority. I'll let you carry on here, Justin. Uh, sure, you know, I, I think the, um, the uh, yeah, I don't know which, do you want me to just scroll on, James, to Emerald? Yeah, let's let's go on to Emerald. Emerald will okay. be the, the last yeah, corridor sure. that yeah, we present here. So Emerald, um, finally a north-south corridor. Um, another, another one where there were a number of concerns raised kind of along the length of the corridor. So there were some requests for additional um, signalized crossings at Barton and Emerald. There were speeding concerns noted um, at several locations throughout the corridor. Um, there was a request for a crosswalk at Wilson and Emerald and uh, speeding and, and traffic calming requests again there um, between King William and Wilson. Um, so why don't you flip the slide, Justin, and um, what, we've, what we've proposed along Emerald and this diagram is, is broken up in two. So the Northern part is on the left and then it ties into the Southern part on the right. Um, so we, we were suggesting at Barton that we um, consider installing a traffic signal at that location. There's still a bit of technical analysis that needs to be done to, um, to confirm the suitability of a traffic signal at that location, but we're, we're recommending that it, it be studied further. Um, we're suggesting a directional closure just south of Robert Street to prevent it from being used as a cut through. So if you're coming south on Emerald, you'd be forced to turn onto Robert, and that would you know, prevent you from using it to, to carry on south down towards King and Main. Um, at the intersection of Wilson, we, we are suggesting that some improvements should be made there, but because there's an ongoing study to look at the two-way conversion of Wilson, we, we felt that it was premature to suggest anything concrete at this point. Um, so we're suggesting that that one be studied further as part of the, the Wilson Street work. Um, but along the entire corridor, really recommending um, speed cushions to address some of the traffic, um, uh, traffic calming requests and volume concerns. And um, this continues on south down to Stinson Street there, where we would uh, you know, tie into the the interventions on Stinson that we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and that brings us to the end of Emerald. So we've we've thrown a lot at you here. We're going to get to Q and A in a few minutes. Um, I just want to outline some of the next steps that we'll be taking as part of this study. So we'll be taking all of your feedback and using it to inform our final recommendations. Um, 
So certainly we, we do appreciate your comments. We, we wanna hear what you have to think about all of this. We will be developing some prioritization for these measures. So um, essentially breaking it down into short-term, medium-term and longer-term interventions. Um, we expect that some of the more complex sorts of interventions like the raised intersections would likely fall into that longer term bucket because they do need a bit more engineering design to go into them. Um, and some of the simpler things to implement would include things like the speed cushions that, that can be implemented on a relatively short term basis. But we will be breaking that down in much more detail, um, short versus medium versus longer term. Um, we will be doing some more um, integration with existing or other ongoing projects and studies just to make sure that our recommendations are aligned with other things that are going on. Um, so the Wilson Street two-way conversion that I just mentioned being a perfect example of that sort of thing. Um, and we will be developing some costing estimates, so putting some numbers to all of these measures um, to help inform the, um, the implementation plan for these measures. And we will be finalizing a report to, um, to go back to the city by the end of August, um, which will guide the, you know, the future steps, which would include detailed design and implementation of these measures. Um, and that brings us to the end of our presentation. So thank you for bearing with us through um, the past hour and 10 minutes or so as we walked you through quite a bit of information. Um, and Justin, I'm gonna hand it back to you to help facilitate things from here. Sure. Um, so first and foremost, I, I just wanna say a big thanks to, to everyone who, uh, who put their questions in the Q&A. Um, just for those who, who were not able to uh, to access maybe the Q&A or, or weren't able to see it, I do just wanna take a minute and just kind of read through some of the responses just live um, before we move on into some of the open questions and, and then quickly into uh, if we have um, questions from uh, from attendees, we'll, we'll do that as well. Um, so the one of the questions that was asked was uh, if it was Main Street that launched this discussion and, and who will be looking at the arterials and um, Councillor Nan responded that both King and Main are currently under review for the entire stretch, including Ward 3, um, and that uh, road staff are going to be ensuring the continuity of information to make sure that um, the elements that are included in this project, particularly within Ward 3, are also provided over into those, uh, into those projects. Um, there was a question about the weighting being given a traffic analysis um, and uh, and the, the willingness to explore new concepts. Um, I think that we showed in this presentation that we are we are recommending a relatively large number of novel treatments for the city of Hamilton within Ward 3. Um, and these have been supported throughout the project by senior leadership throughout the city. Um, and we are really uh, we're, we're just really pleased about the, the relationship that we've uh, developed through this project um, with city staff uh, and the way that it aligns with, um, with the complete streets design manual uh, and, uh, and the overall approach to road safety that the city of Hamilton is taking. We think that this is a, we really see this as a bit of a paradigm shift when it comes to, uh, to mobility in Hamilton. Um, there was questions about where the resident concerns were gathered. So there were uh, emails to the ward counselor's office since 2018, including phone calls. So communications with the ward counselor's office, um, as well as with the Engage Hamilton platform. Uh, and the Engage Hamilton platform uh, is just going to be posted in, oops, I just posted it to host some panelists. So that's not very useful to everyone. Um, I'm gonna post that to everyone so you can find the information there. Um, so those are the, uh, those are the, um, where we got those, uh, the, the community feedback. Um, the presentation and all materials will be made available online through the Engage Hamilton page. So that's the one that is, uh, that I just posted in the chat. So you'll be able, once we get the recording, we will post it on there, um, through the city's YouTube channel. We will also post a PDF of all of our, um, presentation documents, as well as the link 
to the mural board so you are able to go in and dig a little deeper in each of the neighborhoods. Um, there was a question about an audible signal at uh, Barnsdale and Cannon and um, hoping that there's no noise added through our, uh, through our recommendations and we aren't proposing any new audible features for this project. Uh, there was a question about Barnsdale um, and I just wanted to highlight that when it comes to Barnsdale, when we are looking um, at that corridor, we are trying to look at it in the context of the entire uh, area there. Um, there's a, a related question which came in about uh, Oak Street and I did just wanna highlight that, um, you know, we heard those concerns about Oak and uh, one of the things that that is challenging with a project like this is that we are looking at uh, an entire ward, looking at um, trying to develop plans that uh, that use resources in a way that uh, addresses the concerns that are um, kind of highest. And one of the things that we found was uh, that that one didn't have quite the level of volume in terms of traffic when we did the traffic counts compared to some of the other streets. Um, and so it didn't meet our warrant, which is the 500 vehicles a day. Um, but just because it's not on the on the plan here today doesn't mean that it's not something that can't be monitored for future investment and implementation. So the recommendations coming out of this plan all along are to keep an eye on the, the different streets and see how these measures um, change the, the vehicular, um, change the vehicular uh, uh, volumes all along the yeah, all through the ward. We're recommending, as I mentioned, 180 different measures. Uh, so it is, you know, there, there's likely to be some fairly significant, um, some fairly significant changes in traffic behavior um, throughout this entire ward, and we'll see how that uh, how that all comes. Um, one of the big ones was uh, that came up was the question about Wilson Street, uh, and I just want to quickly respond to that from with what Mike Field from the City of Hamilton provided us here. Um, and Wilson Street is planned to be converted to two-way operations um, between Victoria Avenue North and Sherman Avenue North, uh, and that would include reconstruction of the road and is tentatively scheduled to uh, to be done in 2024. Um, Raised intersections came up as one of the uh, as one of the questions um, about where raised intersections have been implemented um, and whether or not it may put pedestrians at increased risk, uh, given that they're at the same level as a car. The best way to describe that is that it's a four way stop, but with speed bumps at all edges of it. So it really does reduce the speed of vehicles traveling through there providing that pedestrian priority. It's a proven countermeasure to reduce the number of collisions and reduce speed. Uh, there was uh, a question about Glendale Avenue. Glendale was uh, part of our review and it does have, uh, we included speed cushions on Glendale as well as intersection improvements at Glendale and King. Um, and that's one of those ones that may also have some changes with LRT. Uh, we already tackled those, the uh, the raised bus platforms, um, the question about Sherman Street, there was a question about is the plan to make Sherman two-way north of Wilson, um, and Sherman is identified to be converted to be a two-way uh, north of Cannon in the master plan. We don't have a timeline uh, right now, but we'll be providing an update soon. Um, there's a question about enforcement, and I, I do think I want to tackle this one just really quickly, which is um, the best uh, type of measures are ones that provide what we call like passive enforcement, and those are the ones where you don't necessarily see compliance because there is a, uh, you know, a speed camera or a law enforcement officer there, you see compliance because the design encourages people uh, to travel slower, to travel safer, and to move through those communities in a more respectful way. And that's really what we've tried to do here with this project. You can't enforce your way out of, uh, of a road safety crisis. And so we really wanted to try and implement the types of measures here um, that, will, uh, that will provide that passive uh, opportunity to increase road safety. 
Uh, crosswalk markings, I did uh, want to address this one. There was a question about, is there any consideration of crosswalk markings, especially in the raised segment at bus stops to be designed by artists? Um, the caution that I would introduce there is that you do need to consider those with the city's accessibility community. Um, those things can look very nice, but they can also present challenges uh, to guide dogs to people with low vision. Um, so those are definitely things that we want to, uh, to consider. Uh, and then the question from Ottawa Street and Maple Ave, we saw that come through a number of different times. Uh, and yes, we are proposing um, a pedestrian crossover there uh, with um, uh, reduced crossing distances. So uh, curb extensions to, uh, to make that crossing safer because that was one of the main issues that we heard through this project. All right, so now we have some open questions. Uh, and I think we had a hand up, but it, it looks like it's down. So, or maybe the person left. Oh, there's a, there's a hand up, but um, I, I, I would, uh, we did have some, we have quite a few questions that have come in. So I, I would ask that if you have questions um, that maybe we can go into the, uh, the q and A, I'm going to uh, turn on the share here and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to show the map that we'll be able to, um, that we'll be able to, uh, to give you a little bit more context, I think, because right now what we're staring at is just the thank you slide and that's not all that useful. So, Hang on, I'm just gonna, I think my share is probably all wonky now. Are we seeing my map, James? Yep, you're good, Justin. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm gonna start here with, uh, with this question um, about the, the sidewalks on Stinson. Um, and the question is, uh, Stinson has the driveway cuts that create sloped sidewalks, which is challenging to walk along. Are there any considerations to make it all one level and use other me means to calm traffic? Um, I don't believe that is is something that we would a, a full that's a full sidewalk reconstruction, and that would typically be done with with a larger roadworks project. Any other comment on that from anyone else? Okay, uh, so we, one thing that we'll, we'll highlight uh, just to the, the question about Oak um, is that we will, uh, we'll, we can, we can take the, we can take that feedback back and we will review the, um, we, we can review the, the traffic volume data there um, and see if, uh, if the information provided, um, you know, causes us to maybe, uh, change the approach. We do, you know, one of the pieces that we recommend is that with any of these ones that where, where there's adjacent corridors to any of the streets where there are measures provided would be that those adjacent corridors be monitored as well. And so that would definitely be something that we would consider, but um, we'll take Oak back and we'll, we'll uh, provide that review. Um, there's a question here about the impact of LRT on this plan, especially on Delaware and other side streets. Um, you know, LRT was kind of, it, it, it was the elephant in the room in this, uh, in this project. Um, we were always considering what the impact uh, may be. Um, and what we prioritized was ensuring that any of the recommendations that we made uh, didn't interfere with the levels of service that the HSR is currently providing in the ward, uh, that they didn't take any of their priority emergency detour routes offline, uh, and that they still provided the level of service that is going to be expected um, during construction. Um, beyond that, what we were really focusing on was improving safety on in Board 3 uh, right now. And so the recommendations that we have put forward, we feel are relatively, um, you know, I, if, if I can say they're kind of like future proof, 
um, in that uh, we would really like to see these types of corridors like Stinson, Delaware, Maplewood um, become more of a transit priority corridor. And, uh, and those are the kinds of measures that we think um, will help to, to move that forward. So I hope that helps. Uh, so I think we've, we've kind of tackled the, uh, the oak one. Uh, when the report is sent to the city, what are the next steps? Um, the city will uh, will use it when they're when they're doing their their road safety projects. Is there is there any other kind of details or context you want to provide there, Brad, or anyone else from the city? Oops, sorry, just uh, turn my camera on here. Uh, so yeah, we have a. Uh, our plan is to take the findings of the report and uh, work closely uh, with our other departments, uh, as well as uh, the, the counselor and the counselor's office uh, to develop an implementation plan. Uh, so we can make sure a lot of these great recommendations uh, do have uh, a plan to be implemented um, and we're going to have to, obviously, with all these great recommendations, we are going to have to figure out how we are going to phase this project uh, and phase these implementations. Uh, so we are looking at breaking up through this project into three ca different categories. It would be the uh, short-term implementations, which would see the more um, immediate measures. Um, and those could be things along the lines of uh, speed cushions, uh, pavement marking, signage, things of that sort. Uh, we're going to have medium term and long term, uh, which those are going to be uh, either addressed through ongoing road works or they're going to have its own uh, kind of process and it's uh, a budget assigned for it. With implementing a project of this large, it's, it's important that we do uh, make sure the proper communications with uh, different departments and, and different organizations are in place. So uh, we, we're going to we're going to implement a phased in those kind of three uh, different categories uh, with the final recommendations there. And uh, yeah, so stay tuned for that once we make a bit of progress on that. Okay. Uh, so there was a question about Senator Avenue. Um, and I will just highlight, we, we didn't have any measures on Senator um, at current time, the, the volumes didn't pass the pre-screen and the block length was under the, um, the criteria as well. Uh, but we can definitely take a look, uh, especially some of those ones that, that may have the, um, a collision history, uh, those can, can sometimes end up, um, moving up on the list. So we'll, we'll review, uh, Senator as well. Um, any ideas when the changes on Holton and Dunsmuir will be implemented? Um, the phasing is kind of the next step for us. That's really where we're headed next is to start to develop um, a, a general sense of the, of the level of priority, the way that we can integrate these projects with existing um, planned projects and, and studies within the city. Um, and so, I can't, we can't really answer that right now, um, but uh, you know, the, the hope is that um, we start to see some of these elements uh, coming down the pipe pretty soon. Hi, Justin, it's Mike Field. Maybe I can just add to that and get some help from Councillor Nan as well. Um, it wasn't too long ago that she dedicated funds for the, the very first phases of implementation. Uh, and that was through a motion at Public Works Committee ratified by Council. So we do have funding in place today uh, once we've made a de decision on finalizing kind of the short term uh, items we should expect to program them and have a number of them installed in this year in the short term and then as was pointed out uh, having kind of medium term long term implementation uh, strategy as well thanks for that um, pivot over uh, mike yeah there was 450 dollars of area rating capital funds 
uh, that have been dedicated to some of the phase one in the zero portion of the zero to one of the short term uh, uh, recommendations that are here and weighing in uh, the criteria of those that are quick to implement versus those might, that might need uh, design reconsideration or kind of longer term engineering work to finalize the, the solution before it can go into spec and into roster for implementation. So, um, yep, we have $450,000 dedicated for implementation right away. Great. Um, there's a question about the showing the priority areas again. Um, I think that's referring to the, uh, I, I think it's referring to the, the collision areas. Um, so I did just want to, you know, I, I think we can see, uh, yeah, if we go in here, we can see all of them. There's all all 10 of them um, through here. So they are uh, up here on Barton, um, at Emerald, at uh, Smith um, on West, and uh, at um, Emerald again. So there's, there's definitely a pattern with these and then a couple on Canon as well. Um, so those are the uh, the ones there, and there are so Delta East has had problems with cars speeding around the corner of Grosvenor and Maple because they can't turn left off of Balmoral. Um, so we did identify that intersection as one of those ones that would uh, be a priority for or a potential for um, for things like centerline hardening, et cetera, um, to uh, to reduce that. Um, Um, so someone says they feel like this is like Christmas. Um, so that always makes me feel good when we get that. Um, that's good. Um, can we speak more specifically to the ways that bicyclists are being considered? Um, so, you know, definitely, uh, one of the things that that we were we were taking a look at was the types of measures that are going to improve safety for people on bikes, um, particularly through the diversion of traffic and the focusing on some of these um, some of these specific routes that we wanted to link in with the sustainable mobility groups um, plans to develop more bicycle boulevards and uh, bike priority streets. So that would be something like done here where through the implementation of those directional closures, what you end up starting to do is creating the type of condition where uh, you create a street where cars are guests. Um, so where cars are not the primary user of that roadway, but where they are still accommodated, um, but they're not the first and foremost user of that corridor. Uh, the people who live there, people who walk there, people who bike there, those are the primary users of that corridor and their needs are considered first and foremost. And so that's why, when you see those directional closures, um, we are specifically making exemptions for bicycles so that bikes can continue moving through the Dunsmere corridor in an east-west fashion um, in a way that is safe and accessible. Um, those bicycle boulevard treatments, those are really uh, a, a, a cost-effective way to develop an all ages and abilities corridor. Uh, that's going to feel a lot more comfortable than even some of the city's high quality protected infrastructure, um, like the bi-directional facilities on Cannon or on Victoria. Those are, you know, those are excellent facilities for sure. Um, but these are the kinds of facilities, these neighborhood greenways or, or bicycle boulevards or quiet streets. Um, those are the types of corridors where, uh, you know, they, they feel like the type of street where, um, you know, you you are riding uh, where you'd feel comfortable and safe riding with your kids, um, regardless of their age, because it is a street that's prioritized for human scale movement. So um, I'm pretty passionate about those kinds of streets. Uh, and so we, it was definitely a priority for us um, to, to integrate that within uh, the city's sustainable mobility plans. So that's why we're looking at Dunsmuir. Uh, it's why we are making some of those recommendations on Cumberland. We didn't really talk about it here, but the idea would be that by improving the conditions for cycling along Stinson with some of those raised platforms, um, and then improving the conditions on Cumberland here to create more of a bicycle boulevard, um, you could 
create that more of an all ages and abilities connection over into Gage Park. Uh, and that's something that we definitely wanted to focus on too, because there is also a connection being built. Um, I can't remember if it's next year or the year after uh, sustainable mobility was telling me that there is um, more protected facilities coming on uh, on Lawrence Road here. Um, and uh, and with the, the cycling, the cycle track on Victoria, um, you are looking at the potential for a really effective um, connected route to uh, to get people to and from Gage Park through all age and abilities facilities. So long winded answer, but uh, ask a guy who loves that kind of stuff about about cycling and you're, <laughs> you're going to get that. Um, there's a question here about when you can expect to see speed bumps installed. Um, I think that in general, the answer is soon. Um, like those are those are definitely some of the things that fall into the quick wins bucket. They are things that the city uh, knows how to do, um, is very experienced in installing, and can roll those out relatively quickly and easily. Those don't require the kind of design and engineering um, and drainage work and all the other stuff that that's required whenever you're doing anything that kind of interferes with where the curbs are placed and those kinds of things. So speed bumps can be in uh, speed bumps, speed cushions. We're, we're calling them speed speed bumps, but really they are all speed cushions. Um, those are uh, those are the kinds of things that um, that uh, th that we would be uh, looking to see move in relatively soon. So uh, ba -ba. our solutions provided on the map where we signaled our concerns. So. Um, the concerns that we received were definitely integrated into our analysis, and they are going to help us inform the prioritization. Um, but they were not just the um, they were not just the um, they were not the only thing we took into account. But they were part of our analysis, and we definitely are uh, are going to be looking at those comments, especially as we start to think about the prioritization. Uh, are we getting a speed bump on Rosslyn Avenue North between Barton and Campbell? Let's go up and take a look. Uh, so, yes, it's an easy answer. Um, anywhere you see the uh, the the blue lines, that would be, um, and and I'll caveat that it is yes, it is proposed. So obviously, nothing is uh, is approved and finalized and done and dusted yet, but. Um, it is approved. Uh, so there's a question about what interventions would deter stopping in bike lanes. Uh, on Stinson, often stopping in bike lanes occurs in front of the apartment buildings and the condo. Um, you know, typically the, the the best way to keep people from stopping in the bike lanes is to make it so that they have to, you know, drive over or through something to stop into it. So. Uh, whether that's um, knockdown bollards or, uh, or or curbs, if there's the width, um, the challenge on Stidson is the significant constraint in width. It's narrow on Stinson. Um, we looked at Stinson Street a lot um, uh, when we were when we were considering what types of measures uh, we could recommend there. Um, we we looked at Stinson Street quite a bit and the width of that corridor does make it a challenge, um, especially given the the high volume of transit vehicles that are using that corridor. So balancing need on that corridor is is a real challenge. Um, and unless there is the necessary width and the distance from the uh, from the, the bus stops that we're proposing um, to install those uh, install some of those physical measures. Um, it may end up just being, uh, you know, maybe the implementation of of uh, of a different model of um, of enforcement uh, is one of the things that uh, could potentially be done. One of the things that was, I mean, it's it's outside the scope of this project, but um, you know, in the city of Toronto, uh, parking enforcement officers on bikes can take a picture of a vehicle stop, uh, stopped in a bike lane, and that person receives a hundred and fifty dollar ticket in the mail. Um, they don't have to serve it on the windshield. So those are the kinds of, uh, you know, it, it's it's outside the scope of this project, but um, you know, the best way to, to prevent that is to install physical separation where possible. 
Um, Ottawa and Maple. Uh, I just want to. Uh, I just want to highlight that it, it it is like it's something that we have absolutely heard and uh, and are are making a recommendation. Oh yeah, sorry. Here, that's a great question. Is there a legend on the map? Yes, there is. Not only is there a legend up here on the uh, on the top. Sorry about that. Um, not only is there a legend, there's actually also examples uh, along the right hand side. So I'm going to, uh, as soon as we put the um, the link in the chat, uh, which I will do now because I, I, I do want to respect people's time. Um, so I'm going to put the uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat here. And you can pop in there all by yourself, um, and you should be able to uh, to use the comment feature. Um, let's hope that it works. Um, okay, so I'm just going to see what other questions are open. I haven't had a chance to, uh, uh, so there's a question. There's several markings in the Engage Hamilton map for a crosswalk at Maine between Hilda and Glendale. Um, there's a marked entrance to the north side of Gage Park there as well as a bus stop, but no crosswalk. Um, so the reason why that wasn't considered is because that is Main Street is an arterial road and it is outside the scope of this project. Um, so with the Main Street uh, uh, investigation project, that's where something like that would be considered. Um, the arterial roads were explicitly outside the scope of this project. All right, um, are there any other folks that wanna answer some of the questions so it's not just me reading? I feel like I'm getting boring here. Oops, sorry about that. Yep, Justin, I can uh, speak uh, to uh, Mary's question about the uh, 40 kilometer an hour installations across the board that you're seeing on some streets. Uh, so that is part of our neighborhood speed reduction programs, uh, Bill 65. Uh, it's been a multi-year process. It was a phased approach due to the sheer amount of uh, signage and work uh, required for that. Uh, but the plan is for the rest of all the signage uh, citywide to be installed on uh, the local neighborhood streets. Uh, so those will be those uh, 40 kilometer an hour area signs that you've seen uh, popping up on the city. Uh, they're done on the neighborhood local streets. So uh, staff are working on implementing the rest of the signage uh, for years end. So I hope that uh, answers that question. So I think I, I, I would like to get a little bit more clarity around Ottawa and Maple. I'm seeing a bunch of questions still coming in. Um, and 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 I'm I'm a little bit confused. Um, so I, I I think maybe what I'll just kind of give everyone like a clear sense is what we are recommending here is that uh, the there be a signalized pedestrian crossover. So that's a push button pedestrian crossover. And whether that is a uh, like a red, green, yellow signal or a pedestrian crossover, like an overhead flashing yellow, um, that would be determined by a more detailed analysis. Um, but the other piece that we would be recommending there, I think based on the geometry of that roadway would be also installing curb extensions to essentially kind of narrow in that, that crossing so that you're only crossing two lanes of traffic instead of four. Um, so is there, I, I, I hope that that like clarifies um, because I am, I'm just a little bit confused um, when I'm seeing the, that, that, we're, that we're not addressing the, the petitions and, and I, I think it's maybe just a, a matter of the fact that we're using a term that's not um, that's not clear. So when we talk about a signalized pedestrian crossover, we're not just talking about a crosswalk. We are talking about something with lights, with pedestrian priority, and we are definitely talking about something that narrows the right of way. Um, 
Okay. Uh, oh, there is a question about um, transport. So heavy trucks using uh, using maple. So I see that one as well. Um, I think that is likely hope. I hope that that's. Um, I think that's being addressed by the city's uh, truck route plan. So. Um, okay. So there's a question here, explain what the blue line through the intersection of Proctor and Dunsmuir means. So that's a diagonal diverger. And, uh, and so that is, that's something that looks like this. So it would uh, it would only allow people to to move through in kind of a turning movement. They wouldn't be able to continue through at either of those movements if they're driving. Um, so I'm just gonna go. Okay, I see. There's the okay. So it's the the cut through traffic from Ottawa to Maple as well. Okay, so yeah, we can we can take a look at that one as well. Um, we do see we did see that that one had over 500 vehicles a day. Um, where that one, I guess, like failed on the pre screen was the block length um, because it's such a short distance between the two arterials. That's where that one would have would have failed. Um, but we can definitely go back and, and take a look at that. Um, and if there is the uh, the necessary um, distance uh, between intersections, then, then we can we can make recommendations for for speed cushions as well, um, or uh, or the right in right out as well, um, as was uh, as was included there. So thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Okay, um, there's a question for the city of Hamilton. How will some of these interventions cross into the other wards in the future? Um, instance in the neighborhood schools in ward two, so outside the scope of this, uh, but there are safety concerns for people walking into the ward two section. I'm sure there are people in ward four going to school in ward three that would have similar questions. Any plans for review of school routes? I think there's a Beasley study going on in Ward 2 right now, Brad. Yeah, so um, I, I can speak a bit to just the general, uh, the safety across other wards as well. Obviously, uh, roadway safety is uh, not something that's just exclusive to Ward 3. Uh, the roadway safety team does look at um, all the wards. Um, and this was just a special project uh, that was done in collaboration with the councillor. There's a few other special projects that are going on across the city, um, one in Ward 8, uh, for Ward 14, and in the Beasley neighborhood. But these projects don't the, the road safety doesn't just stop with these projects. It is something that is ongoing and across the city, uh, we're, we're always doing reviews and, and listening to uh, the feedback and the questions that, that, we have, uh, that we have asked for us. And um, so long and short of it, it, this report served as, is serving as a nice holistic look across Ward 3, but we definitely do take uh, consideration to how other wards uh, experience traffic issues as well. And it's something we continue to work on long and short of it. Um, so there's a question that came in just now to that I, I want to respond to, I think is relatively quick and easy to get to. And uh, it's just asking if, if the arrows are, are pink and kind of pointing in both directions, um, does that mean it's, it's a two way? Um, and so Essentially, what we would be looking at with something like this one here, like with with Spadina, is that north of Dunsmuir, it would be one way northbound. South of Dunsmuir, it would be one way southbound. So, uh, if you were were trying, you can't use. So it means you can't use Spadina as a cut through to get from uh, from Maine to King anymore. Um, so that's what that means. Is it? It would reduce. Uh, it would eliminate those as a as a through route to get north south. So that's what it means. The 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 arrow is where each um, direction would change.
Um, so there, uh, sorry. Um, I was just going to offer to jump in and speak to the question about why were the streets south of Maine prioritized with some traffic calming measures um, already being implemented down there. I, th I think I just want to emphasize that the prioritization is, is the next step of the process. We still haven't established um, a prioritization at this point. So, um, you know, we were looking holistically at the entire ward, looking at all of the concerns that were, were raised by residents throughout the ward, whether that be a street that has no traffic coming at all today or, or other parts of the ward where there are some existing speed cushions, but where um, perhaps they, they were felt to be um, insufficient. So, so really the prioritization is gonna come next. Um, and the fact that the street already had speed cushions didn't preclude us from looking out of this part of this um, analysis. Great. And certainly for, for the intersection of Ottawa and Maple, seeing, seeing quite a number of comments um, still coming in there, uh, you know, we, this is one of the reasons why we do these public meetings is to to understand where um, where maybe we've we've missed the mark a bit, and um, I, I think that's certainly a location that we'll be taking back and reviewing in a bit more detail. Um, certainly, some of the things that we're suggesting there, like um, installing um, an improved pedestrian crossing, that doesn't necessarily have to be um, a, a very long term thing. I'm not I'm not going to. Um, speak for the city here and say that it could be built this year or, or next year, but it 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 may not be um, as far off in the distance as you might think. Um, and and yeah, as I as I said, we'll we'll take a closer look at all the comments that we've received tonight about that location and really uh, drill into it a bit more. Um, great. Uh, there's a question here about can we speak to how this integrates with the city's cycling master plan, um, just in terms of the uh, um, some of the the um, protected cycling facilities that aren't marked on the map, like uh, Holton Birch, Wilson, etc. Um, those are all in the the hopper, but all those corridors that you've identified, like. Um, are other other than Holton, um, the, the one little stretch here, the little that little part, everything else that you've talked about for Birch, uh, for Wilson, those are out of scope. So typically, when when you're thinking about those like protected cycling facilities, cycle tracks, um, protected bike lanes, those would be the um, th those would be the uh, the on the arterial corridors. Those are where those are a more um, like a more desired facility type, um, but we were looking to to see how we could uh, how we could integrate this with the city's sustainable mobility plan. So we know that uh, Victoria is obviously um, in the in the process. Um, there's plans up here uh, in Keith for some improvements on ferry in 23. Um, so they're getting into design for that. Um, the the plans on Birch uh, are are in the works, as are what we understand the plans on uh, on Lawrence. So those are all of the kind of like protected, separated cycling facilities that are uh, planned to come online within the city in the near term. Uh, that's you know that's that what I outlined there. I think goes only to 24. Um, so you're looking at this year, next year, and the year after. So it's a it, it's a pretty extensive amount of new separated infrastructure that's coming into Ward Three to provide that higher degree of connectivity. Um, and so we are definitely, uh, you know, looking at um, how to integrate these types of, uh, of routes with that as well. The question here about the Emerald Corridor for collisions uh, within the Emerald Corridor without much change planned. Um, I, I I think I would just like push back on that relatively, um, you know, we're looking at uh, at speed cushions along the entire direction. We're looking at directional closures, the addition of a signalized intersection, as well as intersection improvements with center line hardening and, and other measures um, at uh, multiple intersections along, uh, oh, sorry, that's East, um, that's East Avenue. Um, we are still a uh, directional closure. Um, at, yeah, sorry, that is right. Um, so we are looking at, at a fairly significant number of measures along that corridor um, that I think will have uh, will have benefit to that. So we're, we're hopeful that um, 
that those types of measures will uh, will reduce the speeds and volumes along that corridor for sure. Uh, Birch. Um, Birch is a uh, Birch is not a um, is outside scope just for everyone's information. Um, it is an arterial road, so uh, it's out of scope for this project. Uh, can speed cushions be installed as a temporary measure of a longer term implementation is expected? Um, so that is, I think the idea would be that the speed cushions would, would be kind of um, prioritized for the corridors where speed cushions are recommended. Um, I don't know if the city has a, has a policy on kind of like more temporary type measures. Yeah, we, uh tend to try to stay away from the temporary type measures. Um, they can be uh, a bit problematic when it comes to um, winter uh, and, and as well as just from a maintenance perspective. Um, but definitely uh, there is some opportunities to have some measures uh, more so implemented as a temporary uh, type installation and then as uh, design kind of proceeds and, and this timeline proceeds uh, to see if uh, permanent installations um, would, would be beneficial or uh, just kind of use the lessons learned. Um, so it is definitely something that we're considering through uh, our implementation plan, which we're working on in the, the phasing for the project. Uh... So this parking, there's a parking question here. On streets that are designated to be made one way, would it be possible to create angled parking for cars to accommodate more vehicles? I, I think it would be contact sensitive on each of these roads. Um, but my suspicion is that most of them, it's, it's probably almost too lean still. Yeah, angled parking isn't something that we considered as part of our review. Um, we were certainly cognizant of the parking pressures in many parts of the ward and really did our utmost to try and minimize any impacts to parking as, as part of these measures. And I, I think there's even a few streets where we've proposed adding parking as, as a form of traffic calming, but mm -hmm. angle parking isn't something that we looked at. Um, I really like the idea of raised crosswalks and raised intersections. Could raised crosswalks be installed in the Delta? And is there any way to sync the crosswalks? The intersection of King and Main uh, has four separate crosswalks to get to the other side. That intersection is out of scope for this project thing. <laughs> Yeah, I ahead. could, Justin, sorry. Uh, so that intersection actually had its own study and I'd be happy to have any of the road staff kind of give an update on that one as a result of the fatal accident that occurred earlier this year on Main Street and that juncture between Main and King um, was identified. So it would be um, a comprehensive review of that particular intersection. One of the complications here that we also integrated into the motion for that direction was to ensure that whatever design implementations or recommendations the city has, it would have to be aligned with the LRT work as that is going to be a significant intersection uh, for the LRT corridor as well. So um, not sure if it's gonna be Mike or Chris. Yep. Hi, Councillor. It's my Hi. field. I can Thank I can you. start off with that one. As you mentioned, we are doing a detailed, it's called an in-service roadway safety audit of that intersection to look for uh, immediate term and long-term um, changes to increase the, the safety performance of that intersection. And as you mentioned, because LRT will be traveling through that intersection, there will be reconstruction as part of that project. And uh, the in-service roadway safety audit uh, results will be given to the LRT design team to be taken into consideration to help out with the design of that intersection. Uh, but we aren't going to wait for LRT to be constructed before we make any changes. We will use that in-service roadway safety audit to come up with immediate <clears throat> immediate changes that we want to make. Um, and um, 
We also, through the motion that uh, you put forward, will be reporting back on the results of that in-service roadway safety audit, including what we are going to do to, to make any changes to that intersection. I don't know, Chris, Day, if you have anything to add to that or not. Hello, everyone. Chris Day. Um, as mentioned by Mike there, we do have the in-service road safety reviews underway. Uh, we expect to receive the results back uh, shortly. And once received, we'll be looking at those and preparing a response there to, to a committee there, as mentioned in the motion, which will include some, uh, some measures that can be put in place in advance of the LRT as well. So thank you. I want to, uh, I want to just address one comment that, that came into the chat and I, I, you know, I think this really um, captures the whole, uh, the entire um, kind of, you know, idea of this project. Um, and, and the comment says it's a win-lose. Um, it's a bit of a pain because I'm at the corner of, uh, of, of a couple of these roads where we're, we're looking at a directional closure. Um, and, and so there's gonna be some additional travel required to get to their home. Um, but the main priority is reducing the use of, uh, of one of these streets being used as a cut through street. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, sometimes you, you can't have it all. Um, there are trade-offs that are necessary here. Um, when, uh, you know, when we are, when we are proposing things that are going to make it more difficult for you as residents of Ward 3 um, to get to your front door um, and get into your, uh, you know, access your access your home um, and result in, you know, a, a slightly different route where, you know, you may have to drive around the block. You may have to go a little further. Um, what we are also doing is that we are making it so that those streets that we are seeing be used extensively as cut throughs um, are not available for people who don't live on your street to use them as an alternative to the relatively dense grid of arterial roadways that exist in Ward 3. Um, and so it is about trade-offs. And, and we, I, I just wanna, I just wanna say that I am so appreciative of the, of the level of understanding and the level of conversation that we have been having here this evening. Um, I think it's really, uh, it's really indicative of the kind of um, it's really indicative of the kind of understanding of the of the challenge that uh, the board three is facing. So I, I just want to say thank you um, for folks. Uh, yeah, sorry, can't have it all, but I'd love to feel safer playing with my toddler on the front lawn. That's yeah, that is definitely the that's the whole thing. Um, it's it's nice to feel like the street in front of your house is not a uh, it, it, it doesn't feel like a shark infested moat 24 hours a day. So um, we only have a couple of minutes left. I wanna just make sure that we get to the actual questions in here. Um, so there was Melrose Street between Cannon and Parton. Needs to have a wider sidewalk in front of Princess of Wales to permit pedestrian access. Uh, we will review that. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question here at speed bumps in 40. I'm not sure what corridor that's about, James. Do you want to answer that one? The speed bumps. Um, the speed bumps the main... 40 kilometer hour signs. Yeah, yeah I, th I think Brad, you spoke to this uh, a little bit earlier, but the, the plan is to roll out those 40 kilometer hour zones throughout the ward. Um, I can't recall what the exact timeline was there, Brad. Do you want to just jump in? Yeah, so uh, end of the year, um, we'll see all the uh, 40k speed limits signed on the uh, local neighborhood streets. Uh, so that was a multi-year project that's wrapping up this year for the local neighborhood streets. Um, and I do want to highlight, you know, we 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 mentioned in the um, in the in the map you'll see there's a few other measures like speed display signs and, and those kinds of things. We didn't really talk about those today, but those are definitely included in the report and they would be a, um, they would be a, a permanent install and they would be a, um, a bi-directional uh, uh, feature ideally. Um, but again, it would be a, uh, it would be a, an option. 
so I think, I think we got through it all. I think we got through all the questions and it's 8.30 on the nose. So would you look at that? Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Councillor Nan uh, to, to wrap us up here. Um, please feel free to continue providing your feedback to us. Uh, we really, um, we're really excited about this project. So uh, Councillor. Well, thank you, Justin, James, for that thorough overview. And thank you uh, to the staff team who also supplemented with some important answers to questions. First off, thanks to all the residents who uh, just stayed with us for the whole two hours uh, to overview this presentation and engage uh, directly on the solutions with your questions. Um, as stated in the presentation, the goal of any kind of overarching safety plan is that it evolves with the needs as they emerge. And so, you know, we will definitely um, work to identify the priority list, implementation list. Uh, so priority, I wanna just leave folks with clarity around what is gonna constitute priority. We've got $450,000 to work with ASAP. And the goal of implementation with those funds will be those that can be implemented within the timeframe. Uh, and within that budget allocation. And as earlier explained, those uh, interventions that need more design work will come into those next stages and then the following stages and, uh, as well. What's great about this is that it is a comprehensive plan. Um, it does enable us as a ward to continue having this conversation, but more importantly, it's a realistic implementation timeline as well. Phase development requires phased investment. And uh, you definitely have my support to make sure that that happens. Um, and we'll see in the new term, uh, either case, whoever becomes a Ward 3 City Councilor, they're gonna have a wonderful blueprint here to work with uh, that is resident informed and technically reviewed in terms of delivering safe, safer neighborhoods. So again, thank you so much to the project team. Thank you to all the residents for joining us, uh, asking our questions and uh, feeding in your comments earlier on and helping inform this comprehensive review. Uh, and in terms of when this report is coming, I just wanted to make sure uh, end of August is when the city is going to be able to begin the review process and start identifying the timelines for implementation. So we'll have an update to the neighborhood in September. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.